This is my Makita KP312 power planer. This is probably the most popular power planer amongst timber framers. Mine's ready for a little service and maintenance, so what I thought I'd do is bring you along and talk about a few tips and tricks that I've learned from using this commercially over the past six or seven years. Now I call it the most popular timber framing um, planer power planer, probably because it's the least expensive, but I always refer to the Makita lineup of timber framing tools as kind of the Toyota Corolla of the timber framing tool world. It's reliable, it's got good resell value, it'll always get you home, but it isn't that fancy. So let's take a closer look. Okay, so I want to focus primarily on the tips and tricks, the things that I've learned from using this for six, seven, or eight years. Uh, there are a lot of videos out there on YouTube about uh, brand spanking new ones that are still all shiny out of the box, and it's usually narrated by folks who haven't used the thing very much. So I want to focus a little bit more on some of the practical tips and tricks. But here are, here's this kind of the highlight reel in terms of features for this thing. The KP312, the 312 refers to the width of cut in millimeters. That translates to between 12 and 12 and a half inches. It is a Tursa style cutter head. And basically that's a style of cutter head that makes the blade change, swap out, and alignment very easy. We're gonna change them here in a minute, but quickly you just un undo all these screws. The knife slides out, you flip it over 180 because they're two-sided, slide it back in, tighten it down, and away you go. Um, the, the knife cutting edge has to be parallel to these two faces, and you can adjust it if it's not parallel. But for me, I have never had to adjust it. It came perfect out of the box, and I haven't had to tweak it since then. So that's nice, but the adjustment is there if you ever need it. Now. One little thing that I thought was gonna be gimmicky and I didn't really have a lot of faith in um, is this little foot there. So basically what that is designed to do when you start your pass at the end of the timber, it's designed to flip up, stay out of the way, and when you finish your pass and you pick it up, it automatically flips down for you. And what that lets you do is set it down easily without having to worry about the cutter head hitting the wood uh, unintentionally. So that's a nice feature. I thought it was a little bit gimmicky, but it actually worked pretty well. Um, the other thing that I use a lot more than I thought I would are these two feet over, over here. So when you are close to your 12 inch maximum width, it's harder than you might think to keep the thing lined up along your timber so you don't end up with a little thin sliver of, of unplaned material on the edge of the timber, which is really annoying. Um, so these little guides, they flip down and they just run along the edge of your 12 inch or almost 12 inch wide timber to keep you on track, which is really nice. I use those a little more than I thought. This little roller is pretty good and it's, it is a nice thing to have for when you've done your 400s pass along a timber on, you know, a, a hot August day and uh, you really don't feel like carrying this thing back down to the start again for another pass. So that little roller is a nice little trip. It's uh, belt driven. I've never had a problem with it, never replaced it. Uh, nice wide handle which makes it really easy to use on both sides. You can lock the throttle on. I don't, but you can if you want to. And the, the adjustment for depth of cut is right here. It's it's very easy and it's actually very very easy to fine tune and get exactly the chip thickness that you're after. The other thing I really nice, what's really nice about it and I really appreciate it is the fact that it comes with a professional grade and a professional length cord. It's a very, very long cord. I've never needed an extension cord on it, which is probably a good thing that you don't add an extension cord to it because uh, this is a big, big motor. And this one and the great big 16 inch skill saw are the two that will pop breakers the most often. So you probably don't want to run an extension cord on it, but I've never actually needed it. So, so that's nice. Okay, so that's the quick and dirty overview of the features. So let's move more into some of the practical tips and tricks. So as I said, it's a little over 12 inches wide in terms of the, of the uh, maximum timber width that it can plane. But oftentimes you're not dealing with an eight inch wide timber. So it's really nice though to have a unit that's wider than the timber you're planning. Because what you can do, you can actually skew the whole unit as you're passing it along the timber, much like somebody who's experienced with a hand plane would do. Basically what this does is it changes the effective cutting angle of the knives in the head and allows you to have another opportunity for getting through some difficult grain. So you might find that a, a particular patch of difficult grain is is fuzzy if you're if you go straight across um, but it might actually 
get through a lot cleaner if you kind of skew it a little bit. The nice thing is is that the, the extra width gives you the opportunity to do that. The other thing that's really nice about it is when you're Tursa cutter head, you've got fresh knives in there and you have a nice clean timber. The finish from it is beautiful. If you slow down a little bit and you don't go too fast, you don't get any knife marks on it. And really the amount of sanding that you would have to do on the portion of the timber that you don't have lines drawn on or anything like that or you haven't dropped your chisel on. The portion of the timber that has just been recently planed you have minimal minimal sanding to do it really does leave a beautiful finish you'll have to do a little bit to get rid of the knife marks because you put an oil on it it will show up but there's really not a lot of work to do after you've planed with this thing with especially with fresh knives now this thing is i can't remember the exact number but it's between 45 and 50 pounds i don't care how tough you are if you've used this thing for an entire day in august you're going to sleep well so this little roller thing here is nice. It means when you're back at one end of the timber and you need to go back to the start again, you don't have to pick the thing up and carry it. You can roll it on. But here's a little trick or a little tip. If you haven't swept the timber off and you've still got a few chips on it, this will actually cause a dent. Now, it's not necessarily the end of the world if you're doing another pass, uh, but it is a good idea anyway to sweep the timbers off after every pass because there's no real deliberate conscious component of this thing that moves the chips away on your next pass. And it is possible to inadvertently get up underneath some, and then you end up with the unit running along on the uneven path. We'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. This foot that we talked about, this little automatic flip down foot. Now it is fantastic, but it is not idiot proof. If you set this thing down, on an uneven surface, you can kind of get a sense by looking at it how much uh, leeway that this gives you. It isn't very much. Absolutely fine on a flat surface. But if you put it down on an uneven surface, you still can hit that cutter head. And if it's coasting down, it's basically still running, and you hit an immovable object with it fairly hard, hard, not only can you ruin the knives, but you can actually damage the cutter head, which would be a bad thing. The other thing is you cannot skimp on this. You absolutely need to have clean timbers. Some folks may think it's excessive, but I have gotten into the habit now of brushing down and sweeping every single timber, unless I'm absolutely positive it's just come off the sawmill and I'm the only one who's handled it. Because even though the knife swap is fast, you don't want to do it. And you especially don't want to do it when you've just replaced them because, you know, they're in the range of 80 to $110 each, depending on uh, depending on your source and um, it adds up to a lot of money so I, I sweep and brush off every single timber before I plane it I'll use something like this I actually have a larger one this is this is made for a broom that's where you normally would thread your broom handle in there it's very very coarse and it's uh, fairly effective for digging grit out of out of the timber so I sweep it all down with that coarse one and then I use a finer brush on every surface on every timber unless I know what it is and it, it makes a huge, huge difference. If I'm really good about it and don't miss anything, it's entirely possible to do an entire job on one set of knives in pine or a lot of other softwoods. It would be a different case if you were doing oak, for example. The other thing is this base, you probably already noticed this. Uh, this base is only aluminum. Um, this thing would be monstrous and heavy if not. And it scratches really easy. So if you do find a little piece of grit and you run across it, you've probably nicked your knives, but you've probably also scratched up the bottom. You can see there are some scratches on mine. So the scratches on their own don't necessarily hurt anything, but typically what happens along your scratch, there's a little bit of a burr of aluminum and it ends up being really difficult to run this thing along the timber. So typically what I will do is I'll just get some automotive wet dry sandpaper or something like that and I will sand it down a little bit and get the uh, get the burrs off. Now it ruins your sandpaper, aluminum, but it's you know it's it's you got to do it. Otherwise, it's a nightmare to try and run this thing along the timber. Now the heavier things are, you probably noticed this from me handling. The heavier things are, the more difficult it is to handle things carefully. And because this is 45 or 50 pounds, it's very easy to set this down a little bit too rough. A client was helping with a job one time and set it down. A little bit too roughly on one corner and it burred up this corner which was fairly easy to fix but unfortunately 
cracked the part of this main casting that kind of serves as a guide for the depth of cut adjustment and there's no real practical way to to replace this so I'm just gonna have to have to live with the fact that the adjustment uh, can go a little bit cockeyed on you anyway so just be careful when you set it down I need to change the knives in this thing so let's uh, let's walk through that and then what we'll do is we'll take it up to the big shop give it a test run and see how it works so what's nice is you're actually supplied with a little t-handle tool for removing the bolts that holds the knives in place and a convenient little storage spot right on the machine itself and that actually works i've never lost a thing so that's great for kind of field removal or field swapping of the knives but if you're in the shop i do prefer a socket and ratchet set so let's put this thing over now all you have to do is loosen these you don't have to actually take them off Okay, so all these are loosened and all you have to do is carefully slide the knife out. What you need to do is get them uh, lined up with this little slot here so that it will slide out from this side. Okay, so now often what happens when you do this, you get a little bits of debris that fall in there and that could get in the way of the knife being reinstalled properly. So you wanna brush that out. And what I find, the best tool for doing that is my wife's toothbrush. Then it's just a matter of flipping or replacing the knife. Then you want to tighten these back down, starting at the center and working your way out this way. The way I typically do it is I'll do it in two steps. I'll kind of just snug them down by hand uh, quickly and then repeat it all. And I typically will use a torque wrench to do that. Now, here's a million dollar tip for you. There's a little bit of wiggle room as to where these things go left or right and what I do is I deliberately set them up on opposite ends of that wiggle room what that means is if the knives are still sharp but you've gotten a little nick in them what you can do is offset them the opposite way from wh the way you started and often the ridge associated with that little nick will go away <laughs> Okay, so obviously we'll repeat that on the other side. Now, one more quick pointer before we go up to the big shop where the sound isn't as good. You want these knives to last as long as possible. So accordingly, you want to take as few passes along the timber as absolutely possible to get the job done. So don't be afraid to increase the depth of cut within reason if it means you still get the surface finish you want and you're not bogging down the motor too much. So within the normal kind of operating range, one heavier cut dulls the knives less than two lighter passes. So then what I'll do is I'll check for burrs on the bottom, sand them down like I described before if necessary. And then what I do is I put a light film of Bowshield T9 on there. It's designed for aluminum and works really well. If at all possible, I'll put it on say the night before and I'll let it dry and then buff it off. But even just putting it on wet like this and then buffing it off really quickly works really well. I've never had a problem with it affecting the finish, but it makes it a lot easier to move down along the timber. The spray version of this is actually much easier to use than this, but that is up at my big shop. Okay, so let's head up to the big shop and see how we made out. So I'll sneak in a quick update on the timber cart. I absolutely love it. It's been tremendously helpful for me. And if somebody stole it tomorrow, I'd buy a new one the next day and put a lock on it. So this short timber has already had the ends cut off. Um, it's destined to become part of the timber frame bracketry that supports the big roof overhangs on the gable end. I, of course, am going to brush it all off really well. But before I can jump right to the power planer, there is one more million dollar tip that I have for you. So you see me here checking the surface with the side of my number six four plane. This is because in well-seasoned timbers, you often end up with a surface irregularity that can really make your life 
difficult when power planing if not addressed. Okay, so this is a cut off from an 8x8 that shows how a decently box heart timber that started off nice and square like this one did will have kind of a humped surface when it's dry and often some cracks. Now these cracks aren't necessarily a problem on their own, but they often create two planes and you cannot reliably ride that hump with the power planer as you go down and just kind of shave it off. It just doesn't work. Basically the planer is going to pick one plane or the other. It can often kind of change as it goes down the timber as well. So the problem is if you want to hit the whole surface and clean it all up, you'll end up riding that plane down until you have and the end result, let's say our planer has picked this plane to ride down and then you've removed a lot of material and you've made it out of square. You've taken a lot of time and you've added wear to your knives. Now my neighbor's chickens, they love it when I make a lot of shavings, but that's the only good that would come from it. The best solution for me that I've come up with too is to hit these humps with my trusty number six four plane. So I can imagine some of you are thinking it's a little bit ridiculous to be buying a nice power planer and then have to do some by hand, but it is time well spent. Uh, it makes the results a lot nicer, especially if you have seasoned timbers. And as you can see, all I'm really doing is hitting the high spots. You don't have to plane the whole timber. It doesn't take very long, about a minute per side, and then you're ready for the power planer. I find it's a lot easier on your back if the timber is as close to you as possible on your sawhorses. Make sure all the grit and sawdust and chips are off before you start. You want to make sure the nose of the planer is sitting nice and level at the beginning of the stick but the cutter head is well clear. Get the cord out of the way and you're ready to go. As you can see the depth of cut must have been selected pretty well because it managed to do the job in just one pass and the results are great. There may be a little bit of sanding around one of the knots but other than that it's not too bad at all. So I'm ready for the rest of the timbers. So I don't have any affiliation with Makita or any company that sells Makita but I'm happy to recommend this to anybody that wants to get into timber framing even at a pretty serious level. If you end up doing a lot of work in gritty dirty wood or in hardwood you might want to choose one of the upgraded head options that are available out there that use carbide inserts. They're a lot longer lasting. If you found this video helpful or informative please hit the thumbs up button. Don't hesitate to ask any questions in the comments. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time.